Not a, not a lot of people, but maybe uh, our person will join us a little bit later. So uh, today we'll discuss, uh, again, implantable cardiac monitors, and we'll do a session on the uh, ABUT confirmed device. So uh, please feel free uh, to stop me whenever you want if you have any questions. So uh, we'll skip the guidelines and the indications as we discussed them last week during the reveal session. So as you can see, uh, the device is pretty similar to the reveal link uh, with a size that is about uh, five centimeter. The insertion tool is uh, pretty similar too with the plunger uh, and the insertion technique is uh, pretty much the same. Like the reveal, uh, you have uh, three options for implantation site, either the fourth intercostal space with an angle of uh, 45 degrees from the sternum. This uh, corresponds to uh, the lead uh, position V2 or V3. You can also implant the device uh, on the fourth at the fourth intercostal space parallel to the sternum, or uh, if you want, you can also implant it under the breast between the, five, the fifth and the sixth intercostal space. So this third site here is mainly used for aesthetic reason because usually the R wave is less tall at this place. The interesting feature of uh, the uh, confirmed device uh, is that you can do a mapping pre-implantation. So you can test with each uh, possible implant position. So here, for example, in the picture, it's the position one that is tested. So all you have to do is uh, plug the EKG cable uh, to the Merlin programmer, and then you display the lead one on the screen uh, of the programmer. So what you're looking for uh, with the mapping, you want to have an R wave that is at least 0.35 millivolts with an uh, RNT ratio of more than two. And of course, uh, it's uh, great if you have visible P wave. Then you just mark the skin uh, and incise one centimeter proximally to uh, the best site. So it's important to know what will trigger the recording for all types of episodes. So uh, for the Brady, uh, you can program, well, the, the trigger for uh, Brady uh, recording will be four intervals labeled as B with a nominal value of 30 beats per minute. You can either program between uh, 30, 40, or 50 beats. For the pause, of course, there's no R wave detected uh, for a duration that is programmable. It's between two and eight seconds. For the tacky, um, it's 12 consecutive uh, intervals classified as T, but it can be either programmed between eight and 50. And the nominal uh, value for the rate is 180 beats per minute, but it can be uh, programmed. If you program the date of birth of the patient, uh, the, the nominal value will then be 230 minus the age of the patient. For AF, it's a 64 cycles uh, window that will look for rate and RR variability. It will look also for, for sudden onset. So the nominal value for the recording, uh, it's 30 seconds uh, prior to uh, the trigger and 120 seconds after. So you can also choose the duration of the recording for each type of episodes. Uh, for AF, uh, it's before and after it's 10 to 120 seconds. And for the tacky and ready and pause episodes, it's between 10 and 60 seconds before and after the trigger. For patients activated uh, episodes, it's longer. So you can program between four and 14 minutes before the, 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 the patient activates the recording and 30 to 60 seconds after. So you can also select uh, the, the storage priority. You can also uh, select which episode will trigger an alert uh, and a transmission on Merlin.net. So you can program a lot of things for uh, the transmission. 
So as I said, you can program the, the and you can choose the priority. So the, the, the programming of these parameters will allow you to prioritize the storage of EGMs. So once the storage limit is reached, so the device has a capacity of 60 minutes of recording maximum. The priority uh, that you set will define the number of EGM stored for each episode trigger. So it can be programmed to low or high. So the recording of a high priority episode will erase a low priority episode if the storage memory is full. But it's important to know that you will keep at least one episode for each type. So if Brady, Taiki, ASSLE, and AF is uh, protected, one of each. The symptoms episode always have a higher priority, so they cannot be erased uh, by an episode an episode labeled as Brady, Taki, Asystole, or uh, AF. So there are important uh, differences in channels when it's when it comes to sensing with the confirmed device as compared to the link. So the device uh, uses two different uh, detection channels. So you have the vSense channel, which is a filtered channel. It does not appear on the recorded EGM, but it, it can be shown in real time uh, with the programmer. And the other channel, it's called the, the VEGM. It's a wide uh, bandwidth channel. It's, it's closer in appearance to uh, surface EKG. And it's a second channel for uh, the analysis uh, with the algorithm. It will be the channel that uh, is used for uh, the recordings of the episode, and it will be displayed in remote monitoring also. And it can be shown uh, in real time with the programmer. So the vSense channel is used for the classification of the cycles. So vSense, Brady, tachycardia, and the cycles in transition. So the classifications of the uh, episodes uh, are carried out from the analysis on this channel. So it's important to that you understand the quality of the detection on this channel is essential to uh, the correct uh, operation of the automatic diagnosis carried by, by the device. And uh, the VEGM channel will correspond, in fact, to the unfiltered uh, vSense channel. So this will be the channel that is used for the memorization of EGMs. And it's the one visible on the PDF tracings. Uh, it will be the main channel for the algorithms. And notably, that we'll see with the sharp sense uh, algorithm in the next few slides. So, just a quick word uh, on the counters. So, as with uh, Abbott ICDs, uh, the cycle classification on a confirm uh, monitor is based on a comparison of the current RR interval duration and the average interval of the last four. Are our intervals. So for example, if the current interval is in the same rate zone as the average interval, the cycle is classified in the corresponding zone. But if the current interval is in a different rate zone than the average interval, then the cycle is classified in transition. And this will be uh, marked as a uh, dash, as you can see here. So uh, the number of cycles required to uh, fulfill the Brady counter is not programmable, and it's four cycles. Nominal value for the tacky counters, as I said before, it's 12. Uh, the pause, uh, well, I think you understand the principle. Uh, it, it, it's important uh, that you know that it will end with the detection of five consecutive cycle, either vSense, uh, Brady, or tachycardia cycle. And all the counters will work simultaneously. And the first to win, well, the first to fulfill its criteria will win, if we can say it like that, the episode classification. The end of 
episode counter, uh, which correspond, in fact, to the return to sinus criterion on an Abbott ICD, uh, will be incremented for each cycle classified as vSense. So VS intervals must be consecutive. A cycle that is, that is classified as B for Brady or T for tachycardia will reset uh, the end of episode counter to zero. And the intervals uh, classified in transition here, for example, the dash here, <clears throat> do not interfere uh, with this counter. So they, they, they do not increment it or and they do not decrement it. So the end of episode counter is non-programmable non as compared uh, to the ICD where we can program it to uh, three, five, or seven. Here it's five consecutive cycles uh, labeled as vSense. So with this device, you can program a dynamic range when it comes to uh, sensitivity programming. So it is recommended to initially set the EGM uh, dynamic range parameter to uh, more or less 1.6 millivolts. So this is to reduce the probability of clipping the signal, as you can see here. So after implantation, you measure the, you measure the R wave amplitude, and then you program uh, the, parameter, the parameter to uh, the value immediately above the measured R wave amplitude. So this is a parameter that must be optimized on a patient by patient basis after implantation and during each face-to-face -face check. So with this device, you can also program the maximum sensitivity. The, the uh, available settings uh, depend on the setting of the uh, parameter uh, dynamic range. So uh, it must be optimized uh, patient by patient. And the maximum sensitivity is generally programmed to a value that is uh, close to a third of the amplitude of the measured R wave. So the uh, sensibility uh, algorithm uh, that is used on uh, the uh, confirm platform is in fact ident identical to uh, the one used on the uh, Abbott ICDs. So it's a sensitivity that is adaptative and you can program uh, various parameters. Uh, so in addition to the maximum sensitivity, you can program the refractory periods, the adaptation level and the sensing decay. So this it's, it's in French, but uh, it's written here. So you can program all these parameters. The difference with the Abbott ICD is that the nominal values of course are a bit uh, different. So now we'll uh, discuss the sharp sense, sense algorithm, which uh, I think is uh, the most interesting feature of this device. So as you all know, one of the limitations of uh, all types of implantable cardiac monitors, it's the large number of false positives that uh, can overload the memories and increase the workload on the medical teams and remote monitor monitoring teams. <clears throat> so uh, Abbott has developed a technology that is called SharpSense and has been incorporated in the recent devices to optimize the quality of the detection. So uh, the initial detection is always provided from the filtered vSense channel. And if a pause, a Brady episode is detected on this channel, then the VGM channel is used uh, and will apply a secondary uh, detection sensitivity to either invalidate on or confirm the diagnosis. And then uh, you will have uh, the, well, there will be an analysis with a loss of contact discriminant, and then it will reject uh, the episode or not. So if the episode is rejected, it will not appear in uh, the device memories. So uh, we'll start by, by reviewing uh, the sharp sense for the pause detection. So uh, for example, if a pause detection occurs, the device will activate an under sensing discriminator. 
So if an R wave is found, it will reject the episode. And if no R wave is found, then um, it will uh, activate the, the loss of contact discriminator. And then if nothing is found, then it will consider that it's a true episode and it will store the episode in the device memories. So how does the loss of contact uh, discriminator work? It will be activated when uh, the pause discriminator does not find under sense beat. So it will analyze two seconds of EGM data prior to the pause trigger, and it will determine if there is a characteristic signature oscillation. I will show you an example in the next slide uh, that is present. So, all false pause detections due to a loss of contact uh, will show a characteristic small noise signal. So it's not always visible on the stored EGM, although. So the, the loss of contact discriminator will look for this characteristic small noise signal in the VEGM channel, <clears throat> and it will reject uh, the original pause uh, detection if the analyzed VEGM section shows a characteristic signature oscillation, as you can see on the screen. So I have another example here. So here it's an example of a false pause due to a loss of contact, and you can see the characteristic oscillation uh, that I was speaking of. So how can you reduce the false positives for loss of contact? So of course you need to have a good implant uh, technique as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation. And uh, it's important to have a tight pocket and this uh, you can uh, well do a tight pocket with the insertion tool. And uh, it has been greatly uh, improved these kind of false positive with the use of insertion tools because the pockets are much uh, tighter and smaller. And it's important to avoid uh, wiggling tools during impl implantation in order to reduce um, a possible loss of contact uh, with the device. So uh, as I said, the pause uh, detection uses two enhancements. So now we'll have a look at the under sensing discriminator. So the under sensing discriminator for the pause uh, will be activated when the existing pause algorithm triggers detection. And then we'll, it will analyze six seconds of EGM data prior to the last send, sense beat. And then it will apply a secondary threshold to the pause window. So I will show you uh, an example. And in this threshold, uh, in this window, it will determine if there is, if there are under sense beats uh, that are present. So let's look at this example. So here you have uh, the pause detection that occurs as usual, and you have the maximum sensitivity that is uh, here depicted in orange. So the pause discriminator is activated and will calculate a secondary threshold to apply on the pause duration. So this secondary threshold will be based on the analyzing window prior to the last sense beat before the detection. And it is unrelated to the program max sensitivity. It will then calculate uh, a peak and uh, it will calculate, in fact, the peak and the variability of the P and R wave over a certain window of time. And then uh, through this window, it will calculate a secondary threshold for uh, sensitivity and it will look for under sense beats. So if there are no under sense beats uh, detected, then the device will check as a second step for the loss of contact. So this is the secondary threshold. It look for under sense beat. If there is no under sense beat, then it looks for a loss of contact. So for example, here you see at the beginning, we have uh, R wave variability. And then the device calculates the secondary threshold. It's a more sensitive one. And then 
it can detect our wave uh, in this window. So the pause episode is rejected. So the secondary threshold for pause can be more or less aggressive, but will be always will always be below the measured R wave median and above the P wave median. So in summary, this is another example of a true pause. So uh, the device calculates a secondary threshold and it uh, looks for undersense beat. So no undersense beats are found. So it's a true pause episode. For example, uh, here it's uh, an episode of a false pause with uh, intermittent undersensing that the device can detect uh, with the secondary uh, sensitivity threshold. So now let's have a look at the Brady undersensing discriminator. So uh, first here, for example, a Brady detection occurs, then the undersensing discriminator will be activated. It will be, it will calculate new intervals based on any new beats found with the secondary threshold. If three out of four initially detected Brady beats are truly Brady beats, then it will stir the episode. Or if two out of four detected Brady beats are not in fact Brady beats, then it will reject the episode. So this Brady discriminator will be activated only when uh, the uh, there is a, a trigger for detection of bradycardia. It will open four uh, pre-trigger windows, one prior each of the four Brady beats that met the criteria for the detection. And then it will calculate a secondary threshold to these four windows, and it will determine if there are undersense beats uh, present. So for example, here the Brady detection occurs as usual with the detection of four Brady cycles. Here are the cycles labeled as B. So the device uh, looks at four windows, one uh, before each uh, Brady beat. It will ignore anything in between. There can be some overlap in the windows. And to do uh, this analysis, it will use the VEGM channel. So the device will then calculate a secondary threshold. So it will analyze uh, between four to uh, seven beats within the windows. And the, the number of beats, in fact, that are analyzed depends on whether the windows are consecutive or not. So it will include the first three Brady beats and any previous sense beat. And then it will analyze the peak and the variability of the P, the R wave and the T waves. Uh, and then it will calculate a secondary threshold. So this, I've already said it earlier. Um, so in this new window, the device will look for understands beats. So if you have a stable and large R wave, the, sense, the secondary threshold will be less aggressive. But here, for uh, as you can see, for example, if you have a declining variable or small R waves, then the threshold will be more aggressive. So to summarize uh, this discriminator, uh, it always looks at a minimum of four windows. Uh, it will analyze the P, R, and T waves uh, in these windows, and then it will calculate a secondary threshold. It will always apply the 600 milliseconds T wave blanking. And then if uh, the device found, finds new uh, beats, it will uh, calculate the intervals and it will also apply the 600 milliseconds blanking. So if the new intervals are not uh, in the bradycardia zone, then it will label it will be labeled as VS and then the device will reject the episode. So at last the device will accept the detection if 
three out of four initially detected brady beats are truly brady beats and it will reject the detection if two out of four are not in fact brady beats so uh this i've already explained so we'll see here an example of a uh, true brady so here are the the windows with the secondary threshold so uh, the device does not fi find uh, any undersense beat so it will store the brady episode and here is an example of a false Brady. So here uh, you have the cycles that are labeled as Brady, but here you have cycles where there are no markers. So clearly under sense beats. So the device will uh, calculate the secondary threshold and will be able to find these beats, which will reject the episode. And this can considerably uh, decrease the false positive. So this, in fact, is working uh, pretty well in this in these device. It's not perfect, but uh, still. So now we'll discuss a bit about uh, the uh, atrial fibrillation uh, algorithms. Just a quick word on that. So the device will uh, do an evaluation on a, a window of 64 beats, and it will look for the RR regularity, the variability, and it will look also for the sudden onset. So all three uh, must indicate AF in order for an episode to be triggered. So works uh, as explained in this figure. So if the rhythm pattern is irregular, it will look for RR variability. So if there, the rhythm had enough uh, sudden changes in RR intervals, then AF detection is met. And then when the, the rhythm uh, pattern is regular, then it will exit the AF detection. So, um, there is something that is called the P wave discriminator for uh, the AF algorithm. And uh, it's quite interesting uh, just to uh, know a little bit how it works. So um, as you can imagine, true AF events will have irregularly irregular RR intervals and will have the absence of P waves. And the false, detect the false AF de detection can happen if uh, there uh, are enough irregularities in the RR intervals, like for example, PVCs, sinus or uh, AV conduction disease and uh, inappropriate sensing. So the P wave discriminator uh, will be activated when there is a trigger for uh, an AF episode and it will look for P waves 30 seconds prior to AF detection. And what the device will do, it will stack select beats to detect the P wave, and it will determine if there is a pattern that is consistently present for the P wave. So I will show you an example. So for example, here, an AF detection occurs here. The device will analyze the 30 second window prior to the AF trigger. So it will determine the qualified beats and it will store a, a template and it will stack all the template of the P waves together. So I won't get too much in the details uh, of the qualified beat. So uh, this is what it can look like. So for example, here there is no correlation, uh, there is no consist consistent morphology or amplitude. So this is uh, not consistent with the P wave. So with a P wave, sorry. So um, it's true, it's an episode of true AF according to the device. And here, for example, uh, this is a consistent pattern for a P wave. So uh, it for the device, uh, it will be false AF. So yeah, non-consistent P wave pattern and here consistent uh, P wave pattern. So probably normal sinus rhythm. 
You can also program a few other discriminators uh, with uh, the tacky episodes to reduce the false uh, positives. So you can uh, program um, the arrhythmia detection during activity either to off or on. And you can also program a uh, bigeminy discriminator. So a tachycardia episode will not be recorded if the device uh, di diagnoses uh, bigeminy with uh, alternating a cycle in a certain repetitive pattern in the uh, RR intervals. And you can also program a uh, sudden onset to discriminate, uh, of course, between sinus tachycardia and uh, VT. So I think the take home messages uh, for the uh, Abbott confirmed device, uh, you need to uh, pay attention to the T waves and uh, R and T ratio at, at implant. This is uh, very important in order to have uh, proper uh, sensing. The dynamic range, as we discussed earlier, is nominally, nominally a program on 0.8 millivolt. So you, but you you need to uh, tailor this to every patient uh, in order to have uh, proper sensing. The maximum sensitivity is nominally 0.125, uh, uh, but you can program less uh, depending on the uh, R wave uh, that you have at implant and follow up. So uh, also the AF, Brady, and pause durations are programmable. And uh, of course, you, you just tear this to every patient uh, according to the uh, implant indication. I just have uh, two tracings that I wanted to uh, show you. Uh, we've uh, reviewed a few tracings with the reveal link. So I think you guys, uh, understand how to interpret how to interpret uh, tracings of, of uh, implantable cardiac monitor but i just wanted to show you uh, the uh, interface of uh, abbott with uh, these two tracings or for example this is a tracing recorded in an 80 year old man known for paroxysmal AF, normal ejection fraction and he had an ILR implanted for syncope so on the graph, you can see uh, the heart rate here that is pretty stable at around 140 beats per minute. And then here you have a sudden drop in the heart rate and it stabilizes at around 50 beats per minute. You have here the marker symptoms. Well, in fact, after it, the first one is pause and then you have uh, symptoms and uh, brady. The, the device, when we look at the tracing, the device thinks also that the patient is uh, exercising. You have the mar marker for activity uh, here. So, and when we look at the tracing, it's hard to tell uh, if uh, there are P waves or flutter waves. It's uh, hard to tell on this tracing. And then it goes uh, on like this for a few minutes. And then you have this. So what's going on here? Our rate is about 140, and then you have a sudden drop. No, Q no QRS. You have the trigger here. It's in French, but it's trigger for the pause detection. And then once again, nothing. A one cycle here in transition, one PVC. And then uh, a little bit later, you also have the criteria that are fulfilled for the bradycardia with four cycles labeled as B. So uh, this, in fact, given the context of uh, paroxysmal uh, AF, this episode is most likely consistent with uh, atrial tachycardia, like atrial flutter with a conversion pause of uh, nine seconds. And one last uh, tracing that I wanted to show you, uh, it's a tracing recorded a 34 year old man that was implanted for recurrent uh, syncope with uh, uh, investigations that were negative. 
So uh, if we look at the tachogram, uh, we can see here very fast, sorry, you can see here very fast cycles. So uh, we can uh, ask whether it is this noise, is this oversensing? The tachy parameters that were programmed in this patient was uh, 180 beats per minute for detection uh, during 20 cycles. So if we have a look at the markers, so we have, for example, here we have vSense, vSense, and then we have uh, the markers here without a change in the rhythm. So we can see it clearly here. So it's pretty easy to make the diagnosis. You have the QRS and then the, you have a huge T wave. So this is uh, T wave uh, over sensing. So this, of course, you need to reprogram this device, usually uh, with uh, the sensitivity uh, at first intention. We do not uh, program the parameters of uh, the uh, uh, adaptative uh, and sensing decay, but in this case, it uh, must be optimized. So that's what we did, and we uh, did not encounter uh, this problem of T-wave uh, over sensing uh, at follow-up. So, all right, so this was the last session on uh, ILR. I think next week we'll uh, continue with uh, the subcutaneous uh, ICD or another topic on ICDs, but uh, we'll continue with uh, ICDs. So thank you very much. And uh, do you have any questions?